Let's turn our eyes upon Jesus. See if I'm right, okay? But I tell you, we have some good potlucks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here we go. We've got Acts 15, 36, chapter 16 to 10. Okay, chapter 16, verse 10. There's a couple of highlights I want to highlight for everybody in here. Is our ultimate priority in evangelism is discipleship. Okay? If 
There can be a, a big church, a big this, a big uh, Billy Graham crusade or something. Praise God, that's wonderful stuff. But if those folks don't keep getting discipled, it's not the greatest stuff. You know, it's just one thing. The best thing is the local church. The local church, wherever size local church it is, we come, we hear the word, and we get evangelized in the word. We get taught, we learn things, and we grow in Christ together. It is so important to grow, okay? It's not just a raise my hand, I follow Jesus thing. It's a growth as well. It's a, it's a total change in life. Everything starts to change for you. And to see somebody get saved and to walk away from them is spiritual child abuse. It'd be just like you had a, a brand new baby and you left it at the hospital and walked away. You know, that's the same thing as what it is if we don't help people to grow and disciple them in Christ. And uh, discipleship, what it means, is it means to teach believers to obey all that Christ commanded. That's what discipleship means. It means teaching them doctrine. Some people don't like that word doctrine, and I don't know why. I think they associate it with the wrong things. Doctrine means teaching. Okay, the entire Bible is doctrine. If we don't learn the teachings of the Bible, what do we know? You know, we can be easily like, like a like a, a, a piece of trash, a piece of paper in the wind, just blown wherever the wind goes, if we don't have some kind of doctrine, some kind of outlines, some kind of frame to it. And the Bible gives us that frame. There's a lot in the Bible to guide us and lead us that we stay in right doctrine. And there's tons of false doctrine out there that as we stay in the Bible, we'll see it and then we'll be able to stay away from it. You know, it's as they say the best way to spot counterfeit money is to be able to realize what the real money looks like. So the more we spend time in the Bible, the more we'll see what real truth looks like. So when bad stuff comes, we're safe. And today we're also going to cover conflict. And it's a part of life in a fallen world. I tell you, we have conflict sometimes amongst ourselves. Okay, We will guarantee we have conflict in our lives at some point or another. There will always be conflict. A world without conflict is some kind of dream. Because it's not this world. This is a cursed world we live in. We live in a cursed flesh, all right? And the only hope is in Jesus Christ. And the only way out of the curse is through death into life, okay? You know, we live under all kinds of trouble right there. And we're going to see even the Apostle Paul has conflict, okay? We're going to see it in today's passage right there. And then I love this saying. I tell you, this was like my theme in the military. Never quit. We're going to see that today, too. Don't quit, all right? Keep on keeping on, okay? Never quit, all right? Because when you quit, bad things happen, okay? Nothing goes forward. You know, I, I talked to somebody this week, and I got all these different things. I'm in my doctorate degree. I'm doing chaplaincy stuff, trying to grow our church. And some people may think it's too much, but the way I look at it is if you don't take the steps today, where will your tomorrow be? You know, if you're not doing something today to get somewhere else tomorrow to be able to improve upon yourself, you'll be the same tomorrow as you were today. And none of us should be satisfied with today is all I need to know and that's it. You know, there is so much more depth in the Bible and the Word of God and life. We need to be digging into it. We need to go deep. And it doesn't all happen right away. It happens step by step, word by word. You know, precept upon precept, the Bible says takes time, all right? So we can't quit. You know, if we find ourselves that we did quit, we got to get back up again, all right? I had some great sayings in the Army that really helped me through. Is quitters never win, and winners never quit, all right? And I can tell you, the first time you quit, like when you had a long road march or something in the Army, it's so much easier the next time to quit, okay? So you got to try to fight on and hang on tight that you don't quit, because the first time you quit, It'll be easier the next time. And if you keep quitting, you're gonna, it's going to be so much harder not to quit. It'll start to become the norm to quit. And you want the norm not to quit. And even if you've been a person that has quit a lot of things in life, it doesn't matter. Today can be the day that you stop quitting and you start walking forward. Okay? It's a brand new day. It's a fresh day. Today is the day of the Lord. Uh, we got to realize there is nothing we can ever do to make yesterday a better day. Nothing. Ever. It's gone. Yesterday is gone. We live it today, and we have tomorrow. No need sulking and being sad about yesterday. We need to be living in today, moving forward, and, if, and don't quit. You know, keep on pushing on. All right, well, I've got a little microphone here. Can you guys hear me better now? Is that not too? We're okay. All right, so, so let me, a few verses to introduce this passage today. All right, this verse right here is 2 Corinthians 3.18. 
I don't know if you can see it, but I'm going to read it. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. All right? So like I talk about discipleship and growth and things. We are being changed every single day. All right? We could be being changed for the worse or for the better. If we're in the Word of God, we're being changed for the better. No matter what else is going on in our lives. That's the only way we can know for sure that we're being changed for the better is that we're staying in the Word of God. Okay? The moment I get away from the Word of God, things start to go bad. All right? It's like a, it's like a natural thing. I can almost guarantee it. If I were to do an experiment, I think I saw one one time, a funny one, a guy ate McDonald's food for 30 days, and he gained like 30 pounds, and his weight was awful, and his blood pressure was awful. If I were to go 30 days without the Word of God in my life, I would have all kinds of chaos going on in my life. I guarantee it. Okay? And if I were to go... The opposite way, 30 days with the Word of God in my life, I tell you what, better things are going to be, okay? Better things, all right? may not be better to what the, the world says is better, but it's better than what the world has is better, all right? Every single true Christian will be transformed, will change from one way to another way, okay? Another little saying I've heard is God loves us too much to leave us the way we are when He found us, okay? He's going to keep changing us and keep growing. And something about preaching... Something about, uh, depending on whatever job you work, okay, maybe your calling isn't to preach, but to do whatever you do, is we ought to have passion, all right? And whatever we do, we should have passion, all right? Passion isn't something that can be taught. You can't teach passion to somebody. Passion is something that has to come from within, all right? And it's, 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 it's caught. It's not taught, I wrote. But you know how it does get caught if you don't have any passion about the Word of God? It's by spending time with God. The more time you spend in the Bible, the more time you learn the Bible, you will get some serious passion, all right? And it will grow and grow and grow. And maybe that's not your calling to be a preacher, but it also, you know, in a little miniature sense, also goes toward jobs and things. And we're going to talk about that in there. All right. One more verse before we get started. It says, 1 Corinthians 4.15, For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel, all right? And uh, so this is Paul writing, all right? And Paul found some folks in Corinthians, all right? Got the church founded out there. Started to disciple these people in Corinth right there. And it was something special to him. In fact, you see often that Paul goes back to the same place as he was before to continue to disciple, all right? In fact, Galatia... Paul went three times to Galatia right there. You can count it through the Bible. Three times he went there because he wanted to keep going back and make sure that they're learning the Word of God, there's no false doctrine going on, and that things are going the right way. All right? So I wrote up here, spiritual mentorship. All right? We should also be able to look at our own lives and be like, who is my spiritual mentor? Okay? Maybe some of you guys may be under spiritual mentor. I surely hope I am a spiritual mentor at least. All right? But we can look through our lives and think about when we became a Christian and who was it that shared the Word of God with us? Who was it that stepped forward and cared enough and loved us enough to tell us the truth and to help us and to teach us? Okay, those are special people in your lives. They should be. And those are the kind of things that you should be as well. We should be looking for people that we want to mentor spiritually. All right? The priority in evangelism is discipleship. Okay, that's the priority. It's more the priority than just handing out a gospel track and walking away. I do hand out gospel tracks. I keep them in my wallet all the time, these million-dollar bills, all right? And, uh, but I've learned if I'm going to hand out a million-dollar bill, usually it's to somebody I don't think I'm going to bump into again or something. You know, it's like a stranger. It's like a passing by. It's like a cold call. But if I am around somebody that I'm going to keep meeting, I'm going to keep seeing, then I'm going to invest myself in them. I'm going to... Talk more to them than the, just the straight, hey, read this right here. Jesus saves, repent now, and believe. I'm going to do much more than that, okay? I'm going to try to develop a relationship. I'm going to try to connect. I'm going to try to meet their needs right where it's at. Because I tell you what, every single person has needs. Every one of us has needs, all right? We all have needs in our heart. And those needs, if you meet those needs, it's just like that Bible verse, you know, to the guy that didn't have any clothes, like you were naked, and uh, did you clothe me? You know, I was hungry, did you feed me? All right, we have needs. People have needs. 
And I can go through life trying to meet people, trying to meet their need. And it may not be a material need. In fact, most people, the way that they can find the greatest peace is just by having somebody they can talk to. Somebody that will listen to them. Somebody that they can help them process whatever need and pain is going on right then and there. And we can be that person and then bring that into prayer and then eventually bring to the gospel and start a real discipleship relationship. All right? So here we'll start the passage. It says, Acts 15, 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. What a great idea. He's like, all those cities that we established, all those churches in, he was like the massive church planner, Paul. He's like, let us go back and check them all out, see how they're doing. Barnabas is the son of encouragement, okay? He was a responsible disciple. Paul wanted to get out there and disciple and then it says, Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. And this is the guy who wrote the Gospel of Mark, okay? And the uh, and, uh, encourager always saw hope. You know, we read before, a few chapters earlier, that, that, that uh, Mark had left them. He had left them on the mission field. Let me tell you how bad that is, all right? In the military... Uh, I think that the biggest reason, like I was a ranger, I was special forces, I did all these elite things that most guys didn't do or were too scared to do, all right? wasn't that they couldn't do them, I think. I think it's because they psyched themselves out mentally and just didn't do them, all right? They quit before they even tried, really, for the most of them. But what I always saw was the reason why they tried us so hard, why they put us through so much stress and pain and vigorous training, was they wanted to see who would quit. Because you absolutely cannot have someone quit when you're on the mission field, when you're out in Afghanistan or Africa, far away from anything. You can't afford for somebody to get sorry about themselves and quit, because then they become a huge liability rather than an asset. All right? And Paul was not willing to take Mark again after that had happened. All right? And I'll tell you what, most of the military today... Is as soon as the guy quits, that's it. He's gone. All right. In fact, it is like a everybody gets real angry actually if a guy gets another chance after he quit. A guy may get hurt. A guy may have a hard time. A guy may not quite make the standard. There's mercy. But when a guy quits and then somebody says, "Don't worry, we're giving another chance," everybody has this hidden anger. Like what? We're going to let a quitter stay with us? It is like the biggest. Thing in the military that you do not quit, at least special operations. And I really consider Paul, he was like beyond special forces. He was beyond Navy SEAL. He was beyond Delta Force and everything we can imagine. He went to places and did things that no man I know could ever do. You know, he was stoned. He was whipped with whips. He had all kinds of things happen to him. He was an unconventional warfare guy all the way. So I bet he had this warrior mentality too that, you know, you know, we're not taking a quitter with us. That's it. All right? And he looked at Mark as a quitter. But Barnabas, the son of encouragement, still saw hope. And that's a very compassionate thing. You know, we need people like that. Because I tell you what, we're all going to mess up sometimes. It says, but Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. All right? So he quit. And now... We can look at this and we can be like, who's right, who's wrong? That's the big argument with theologians on this passage. Was, was Paul right? Was Barnabas right? Who was right, who was wrong? Well, nobody really knows, okay? The Bible doesn't tell us. But if you look at things, Paul was an apostle. You know, apostle was like the top authority figure there was. Barnabas was not an apostle. Barnabas should have listened to the apostle. Barnabas should have submitted to Paul. He did not, all right? But he should have, all right? Does that make a... Does that mean that God still didn't use these things for good? By no means. We think of verses like Romans 8.28 and Genesis 50.20. God can use everything for the good for those who love God. And God's going to, his, his sovereign will is going to happen right here. And it probably was part of God's plan. All right. So we see here, and there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. All right. This sharp disagreement, if you look into the actual words of what they mean in Greek, it basically translates over into us, it, it's like violent hostility is what sharp disagreement means. It translates over to rage. I mean, you can think of yourself maybe, if you've ever got so angry, it's like you've raged, you're like shouting, or you're so angry, like rage overwhelms you. 
This is what happened between Paul and Barnabas. In fact, it was so bad, we never see Paul and Barnabas ever work together again in the rest of the Bible. We don't see anything. We do see Mark come back to Paul later. You know, Paul actually asked for Mark, and he's like, I know he's a, a, a guy like me following the Lord, but we never see ministry again between Paul and Barnabas. I mean, this was major division that happened. And you think about this, I bet the devil was behind it, all right? Now, I'm not one to say the devil's behind everything. I think we ought to be like Job. Job, the devil was behind everything, but God allowed him to be behind everything. And not one time in the book of Job does Job mention the devil. Not one time. Ten of his kids killed. Everything he's got, gone. Disease from head to foot. And not one time does he blame the devil. Not one time does he say, this is what the devil did to me. He knows it was ultimately God that allowed the devil to do that to him. All right, Because the devil has no power outside the power which God has given him. At the same time, I do believe the devil is probably the most powerful creature ever created in creation. It's probably the devil, all right? I don't think any of us are stronger than the devil or anything like that. Only God is strong. He that is in us is greater than he that's in the world. But if you put the devil where he's at, he's not some little guy that we can just squish, all right? Even Michael the archangel, if you read the book of Jude, over the bones of Moses... He didn't just push the devil away when they were arguing. He said, the Lord rebuke you. He used the name of Jesus to rebuke the devil and to defeat the devil. It wasn't himself that could even do it. And as long as we look, you know, Michael's the, the head angel right there, okay? So the devil is very powerful, but he has no power except for what God gives him, okay? God allows him. God is his master. He serves God. He has to serve God or God will squish him. He knows what his end is. His end is no hope. His end is the lake of fire. He has a time. He has a purpose. All right. It's an evil purpose, though. It's not a purpose that, that God that God put in effect as the primary cause. Okay. Originally, he wasn't made the devil. He was made an angel that sang before God and was like a high high in the courts of heaven right there. But we can read about his fall in in Isaiah 14 and in Ecclesiastes or Ezekiel chapter 28. You can read about the devil and his fall. Secondary causes caused him to go where he went. Here we see, here we see some things about, about jobs, okay? I want to cover this. And I love the way this is. I don't know if some of you know the guy I like to listen to sometimes, but this is one of his cliche sayings. A butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker, all right? It actually comes from the Old Testament, okay? <laughs> the book's Old Testament. But it's pretty handy to say a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker, okay? What has God made you, all right? And uh, the word vocation is different than job, okay? Vocation comes from the Latin term to call, okay? You're called to do some type of work, okay? I know, I know myself. I've seen some of you guys in action. I've seen Brent with uh, wiring. The man is called to do some electrical stuff. I mean, he's just gifted with it, okay? I see and we, we're gifted with certain things, all right? And it's like we're called to do this kind of stuff, all right? And whatever our appointment is, we should see it as a calling from God, okay? You shouldn't be sitting there thinking, one day, I'm going to be a preacher. If I'm not a preacher, I guess I'm not doing the calling of God. That's totally wrong, okay? Not everybody's called to do the same thing. You know, it talks about the body of Christ. One person's the finger, one person's the ear, one person's the foot, and we all need each other all the time, okay? And God calls us in all different directions all the time. Now, most people lose their jobs for incompetence. So if you've ever lost your job, maybe it's something they put on your review and you're like very upset and heard about it, and you thought, I'm incompetent. What do you mean I'm incompetent? All right? And incompetence just means you have not yet found the job the guy has gifted you for. That's all that means. If you lose a job because they say you're incompetent, oh, golly, who are they? Who are they to know? You know what? Maybe that's not the place God has for you. Okay? Maybe it is. Maybe you just need to work harder. Maybe it's not. All right? It could be, though, the providence of God indicating that we are in the wrong place at the wrong time for the wrong reason. All right? When we go and we... And we get fired from a job or something doesn't work out, okay? Where is this coming from? It's coming from John Mark, Paul, Barnabas, okay? Going different directions. It wasn't right for, for, Bar for uh, Mark to go with Paul, all right? Paul fired him, basically. Paul let him know, you're fired, you're not going with me anymore, all right? And people all the time think, well, as Christians, we should have all this grace and mercy and be like, don't worry, brother, I forgive you. You keep messing up, don't even do any kind of job at all, and it'll be okay. And that's not how it ought to be, okay? It ought to be that we take ministry seriously, that we take what we do seriously. And if somebody isn't fulfilling what they should be fulfilling, 
Then they may need to step aside, okay, so somebody else can fulfill that calling right there, all right? And it goes for all of us, okay? It doesn't mean we all have to step aside from where we're at right now, but sometimes in your life it might be like that. You may come across this one time in your life and realize, and you think about this sermon, you think about this passage right here, God really blessed what Mark did later. Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark later, okay? He listened to what Peter said. Peter dictated from the Holy Spirit. Mark wrote it down, and the Gospel of Mark was written out, okay, through this man, all right? So, we can see here, to not allow bitterness and hatred and hostility to come between us, all right? You may, somebody may fire you, and you may get real bitter and hostile and hate them and stuff. Gotta let that go, okay? That's not going to hurt anybody but you, all right? I talked about, I've learned a lot about forgiveness. Forgiveness is really a me thing. It doesn't matter for the other person at all. They could care less if you forgive them or not, okay? If they've wronged you, they don't care that they wronged you most of the time. If you bring it up to them, they're just going to get madder at you. Forgiveness is about yourself because you're bearing the hostility, the hatred, the bitterness within you, and you are the one who has to deal with it. You're the one who's suffering from it. You're the one who's in pain from it. Even if it's the other person that wronged you, it's still wronging you. It's still hurting you, and they don't care probably, all right? It doesn't phase them. They're going through life without a thought about it at all, and you're like suffering your whole life, and that's why the Bible says that you must forgive, okay? It's not about the other person as much as it's about you. You've got to forgive. It's the same way with a job or something. You lose your job, Okay, you think that boss is like thinking, oh man, I wish I would have kept them? Probably not. Now if they let you go, they're probably relieved that you're gone, okay? But you are sitting there with your bitterness and hatred and hostility. You've got to let that go, okay? And that's what we're going to see. As we see Mark lets it go, okay? And we see that Paul and Mark have a reunion again, all right? And here's a, a saying from Einstein. Einstein was not a Christian, but he thought about God. But he said, failure is success in progress, okay? That's kind of a... A deep saying right there. Think about it. Failure is success in progress. I used to say in the military, if you're not failing once in a while, it means you're not really trying hard enough. Because until we're hitting the points where we do fail, how do we know we're at our full potential? You don't. Okay? If you always succeed in everything you do, you probably could do a whole lot more. Okay? But you don't ever going to know until you hit those boundaries where you start to fail a little bit. All right? And that's the real truth right there. Okay? Just because you fail doesn't define you as a failure, okay? Sometimes we're going to see some things. We're going to see where we mess up. We're going to see things. If we're, not, if we're not going on the broad spectrum of things and failing sometimes, that means we're not really pushing ourselves to our full potential, all right? And look at this. I'll even have a personal testimony here I'm putting here. God, how God took me into the ministry. Do you know, I, I'll tell you my whole testimony, but I don't want to talk forever today. So I'll start right here with it. But when I was in the military... When I was in my bachelor degree, I was Special Forces medic, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go be a PA. I'm going to be a physician assistant. And I thought, I'm going to go and I'm going to finish this bachelor in health science I was in. A lot of my fellow Special Forces medics were all becoming PAs. PA is a high-paying job. I thought this is a good thing to do. Well, as I was in my bachelor degree with P for uh, to be a PA, I realized I have a serious issue with math. All right? <laughs> College algebra, I got a C. The only C I've ever gotten in any college course in my life was algebra, all right? It was horrible, all right? I tried so hard. I mean, I did like eight hours, ten hours on a homework. It should take 20 minutes to a normal fellow. It just didn't click in my head, all right? I tried so hard. I had people that were calculus, seven people helping me. Still, it wasn't clicking in my head, you know? It just it wasn't something that was working for me. Obviously, it wasn't my calling of where I was trying to go down because if you're going to be a... Uh, uh, a physician assistant or anything, you've got to know a lot of math, okay? And that wasn't clicking for me. And then, on top of that, as I kept trying to make it work anyways, I ended up getting orders to leave to move to Germany. Mm -hmm. And then, as I had orders to move to Germany, I had to change some classes around so I would finish my bachelor degree. And they said, oh no, you can't take, uh, you can't take biochem without chem 2. You know, first you have to do Chem 2. And I said, I'm going to take both at the same time. They're like, no, it doesn't work like that. I'm like, I need a waiver. I'm going to leave. They're like, no, you get no waiver. So I said, all right, then. Well, I'll just, how do I finish it? I took a bunch of upper-level business classes and got my Bachelor in Applied Science, all right? And it changed it right there. Then as I'm walking through the military, and I'm a Special Forces Team Sergeant, the ultimate pride of life for a Special Forces guy is to be a Special Forces Team Sergeant in charge of an A-Team. 
and I had this team, and I'm in Afghanistan. I had mutiny on the bounty going. I had serious issues going on with guys underneath me. Things that I don't know why they were going on. It was just a hard way. I mean, it really broke me. It was probably one of the hardest times in my life because this is what I thought everything was to be about for my career. I was dead set on it. Then I ended up working at Battalion Med for a little bit after that, and I thought, you know what? Maybe I'll go back to a team one day. I'll take another team. Other guys were saying, Buck, we we'll give you another team. All right, this stuff happens sometimes. You have a hard way. Then I broke my back on a parachute jump. Jumping out of an airplane, I land, and my L2 broke, and I was laid up for over 30 days, and for a year I spent suffering. And now I look back, and then I started seminary about four months after I broke my back. All right, and I had the I, I had had a huge life change during Afghanistan when that happened, that I read my Bible through and through from back to front, put me back in the full submission to God where I should have always been, rather than being a hypocritical Christian like I was for some years while I was in the military. And that gave me the way in Battalion Med to start seminary at nighttime and do 93 semester hours online at night before I was able to retire. If I was to say a Special Forces Team Sergeant, or gone like 11 months a year, kicking in doors, getting bad guys, doing stuff, I wouldn't be able to do that. I wouldn't be here today, all right? I can look back and see how God's sovereign hand changed things in my life to bring me to the point I am right here, right today. And I tell you what, it was through a lot of heartbreak, okay? I really wanted to be a PA one day. I really wanted to be a Special Forces Team Sergeant. I wanted to be a Sergeant Major one day. I probably would have stayed a lot longer in the military. But all these things happen, and think about it, maybe God wouldn't have to break my back if I would have just listened, all right? Maybe, maybe if I had submitted myself in Afghanistan and said, you know what, obviously this isn't where the Lord wants me to be, I'm going to look for the new opportunity where God wants me, I would have been okay. But I'm a hard-headed type of guy, and I kept pushing, and God had to break my back to injure me, to humble me, to let me know this is the way I want you to go. And ultimately, that happens sometimes. I'm not saying it happens all the time to everybody every time you're broken or something, but you can look back through the pains in your life, and you can sometimes see what God was doing and what good became of that pain, all right? You don't have to just look at that pain and just, I don't want to think about it. Oh, it hurts so bad. When you map something out and you look at it, sometimes you get to see the big picture, and you be like, wow, you know what? This wouldn't have happened if this hadn't have happened over here. You can see the blessing in the suffering right there, usually a little ways later. It's usually not right away. But give it time and look at things, and you'll see God's hand is within it right there. Like I said, back to that verse, God uses all things, the good and the bad, together for good for those who love God, for those who believe. Romans 8, 28. Yeah. It's not like that for those who don't believe. It says for those who believe, all right? So that's just my own personal thing. So what are you going to be, a butcher or banker or candlestick maker? I don't know where God's called you to be, you know, but wherever it is, you should be passionate. So here we see Paul chose Silas and he left, all right? Silas is a prophet. We're not going to get into that, but if you dig down into Silas, who he was, talked to him about before and Acts, talks about him later, he was a prophet, okay? What a great guy he took. He took a prophet with him, an apostle and a prophet, moved out. And they became committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. All right? There's a lot of talk about Syria in the Bible, I tell you. We look at it as a place like, whoa, we don't want to get killed. Let me tell you, these guys were all over Syria. And, uh, and we can see Paul's commitment. All right? Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, okay? So it basically means his father was a pagan. He had some false gods, probably worshipped Zeus, you know, Hermes, uh, 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 somebody, you know, we've all seen those different pictures. We look at it as a joke. They looked at it as serious, okay, that these were really their gods, all right? So here's the introduction to Timothy. He already is a believer. He's already a disciple of the Lord, so... so uh, and look who did it was his faithful mom. And later, when you read it, Timothy, his grandma was also very faithful. And I think this goes to show us how important it is for the women, for the mothers here, and for, uh, every, and for grandmas to teach those children in the Lord, to teach them to love Jesus, to pray for them, to lead them, because it does amazing things. Look what it did. You know, this guy, Timothy, if you, there's only two pastoral epistles in the Bible. Okay, there's the one to Timothy, there's two of them, and there's one to Titus. That's it. There's only two pastoral epistles. So out of the two guys that we see how we ought to be pastors and 
how Paul trained these guys up and led them in the right way, this was one of them. And how did he become a, a Christian? It was because his mom discipled him right there. I mean, he's saved by the Lord by faith alone. But what means happened? Because his mom was faithful and taught him the things of God. Something that breaks my heart to no end is when I hear some parents say, I'm going to let my kid believe whatever they want to believe. I'm going to let them decide. That's horrible. That's like saying, I'm going to let my little baby over here buy all these poison pills and decide if they want to eat some poison or not. Because that's exactly what you're doing if you care so little for your children that you say, I'm going to let them decide whatever they want to decide. Because you should know better as a believer that there is evil all around us. That the devil's at work. It calls him the prince of the air. And to let them decide what they want to decide is horrible. The Bible even commands us. It tells us that teach our children, to, to love our children, not to, not to bring our children to anger, okay? we got to raise them up in the Lord. we got to love them. We, we should care for them. God has blessed us with this special gift of a little child. The most important thing we can do is help them to love Jesus Christ. In the end, they're saved by faith alone and Christ alone. In the end, it's only between them and God. We can't mm -hmm. save them, but we surely can teach them, train them, and love them. And Timothy is a perfect picture of that. It says that he was well spoken of by the brethren who was Lystra and Iconium. Okay, if you look at Timothy and Titus for the for the qualifications for a pastor, for an elder, you have to have a good reputation. Okay? Now does this mean you always had a good reputation? I think we can look at the Bible and say no, because who was Paul? Before he was Paul, he was Saul. And what was he doing? He was killing Christians, okay? That wasn't a good reputation right there. He was they were terrified of, of Saul, okay? And you can look at guys. The tax collectors, different things, and how God changed them from one way to another. But once a man is changed, once a man is following after the Lord, he should have a good reputation. should follow him. It shouldn't be like, oh, you mean that shifty guy that robs everybody? That guy is going to be your pastor? That's not, it shouldn't be like that, okay? The man should have a good reputation. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. All right, now this has made huge controversy with those that get real deep in the scripture. Because if you remember from last week's preaching, if you were here, is the huge fight broke out because the Jews wanted to circumcise all these new Christians that were Gentiles because they weren't circumcised people. And, and it wasn't the way it should be, okay? In fact, in fact they, told, they got so mad at them and they basically said, that they are saved by faith alone and Christ alone, just like you are saved by faith alone if you're saved, all right? That it's not any work, it's not any action, anything. And here you have, now Paul is taking this uncircumcised guy that he's trained to be a pastor, and he's he's circumcising him. It's kind of an intimate thing between the two of those fellas, okay? But he's circumcising this guy, and, and that would seem, I, you know, wrong. But here it's because of the purpose, okay? He wasn't circumcising him because he needs to be a better believer. He was circumcising him, it says right here, because of the Jews who were in those parts, so that he could bring the message to them and be easier to understood. Now, how do all these guys know if a guy's circumcised or not? I wonder. I don't know. I think, man, the guy's got his clothes on. How do they know? You know? But somehow, there must have been some way that they would have known or something at some point in time. So Paul circumcised him. So that as he's preaching to the Jews, it won't be any hindrance, there won't be any wall that would block him from being heard. Okay? It, it brings you to, uh, to other things in the Bible, you know, and, and uh, I have some verses. I have the next one, we'll talk about that verse. But if he was to circumcise him because he had to be more saved or to do some kind of work or action, that would have been legalism. Okay? For you to try to say somebody should have to be just like you with some kind of you know, gray area like that or something, would be legalism, all right? Legalism does nothing but kills. What does it say? That the, the letter of the law kills, all right? It really does if you just take it without the spirit right there. We've got to have the spirit. If you later see, like I said, there's a second guy that he, that he brought up to be a pastor, Titus. He refused to have Titus circumcised. He said, there's no way you'll be circumcised. If you look at uh, Galatians 2.3, it was refusal for him to circumcise Titus. So one of his two prodigies, he circumcised. The other one, he refused to have circumcised. So it had nothing to do with salvation. It was all to do in how you would be uh, presented to people. Okay? And here's a verse in 1 Corinthians 9.19. This is why. This is something that can be applied for that with circumcision. 
But though I am free from all men, like I don't have to follow any rule of any man, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more. This is how humble Paul was. You know, I think of Moses. It says in the Bible that Moses was the most humble man right there, the most humble man on the earth. And so was, and I think Paul was very humble as well. You know, he allowed people to whip him. He allowed people to stone him. You know, he did all these kind of things so that he might win more, so that he might see people come to Jesus Christ, all right? And at the same time, like I said, he didn't circumcise Titus because that was the wrong thing. He was straight up Gentile both ways. His mom and his dad were, were pagans, right? But, but here, here the other guy, you know, his mom was a Jew, his dad was a pagan, and he was like, well, if you're going to be with, uh, you know, good for the Jews to hear you, you've got to be circumcised, okay? And if he would have circumcised Titus, it would have been legalism, and, and, it, and it really shows that the, the, that, that would have been the wrong thing. The, the priority here is reaching people for Jesus. I wrote work first. He's got his priorities straight. Like I said, with the whole thing with firing a guy or hiring a guy, there's a lot of ministries to fire pastors, hire pastors, do different things because they need to be effective, okay? And it's got to be work first. What, what's the priority is the work first, all right? Now, Acts 16, 1 through 5. Now, while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. And there were four decrees, okay? We talked about those last week. The only one that he kept talking about was sexual immorality, that people shouldn't be sexually immoral. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily, okay? How does a church get strengthened in the faith and increase in number daily? With good Bible teaching, okay? Because what are they doing? They're teaching the Bible. They're discipling. They're leading. They're helping them to learn doctrine, to learn the skeleton work of the faith. That this is this because this is this. Because this is this way and this is that way. And all these things coincide. If anything you read in the Bible ever doesn't coincide with something else you read, you're going to have to stop and do a search. Because either one or two things is happening. You just don't understand something the right way. Or two, you've been taught a false doctrine and you need to change it and submit to God and let that go. Okay, uh, they call them uh, love lines, okay? If you look at like psychology or something, we all come from our certain love lines, you know? Maybe you come from a, a love line where you, you baptize babies, okay? And then your love line and your love tradition and your denomination, you baptize babies all the time. It might be real hard for you to stop baptizing babies if you come to realize in the Bible no babies were baptized, okay? Amen. And those, that's just one example of a love line. But we've all got some love lines in life that have come through somewhere, and we've got to be able to sever those love lines and follow the Lord, okay? Above all things, we've got to love God more than anything, all right? If we don't love God more than anything, we're really missing everything, all right? Does that mean that we don't love our children, our families, everything? No, by all means. The Bible tells us we're supposed to love everybody. So that's we're supposed to be good to our family. It says a man that doesn't provide for his family is worse than an infidel, worse than an unbeliever, okay? So it's not saying that you hate your family and stuff, but it's saying that you love God first. And sometimes those love lines that have come down in life, that have been very traditional to you, you've got to cut them off right there. Okay? So that way we can be strengthened with good Bible teaching and let that saturate us. I tell you, it's like we all have filters in life, all right? And we, we get established and we're rigorous mountains and we've so, so much time has formed every single one of us in our lives and our thoughts and our thinking, our personalities and who we are. It's not easy to let something else in. It's like we have fine screen filters. It's like only the things that are allowed to come in do we really look at and then we let it come in. But when it comes to the Word of God, we've got to get ourselves right in a prayer and a praise attitude and a worship attitude of submission that whatever this says... It dominates. It's okay, like, rip the screen open. Let the Word of God come in, even if it, it's going to disastrously rock my mountain and break me down in pieces like gravel all around me, and then reform me again. Because to not be formed by this is to be formed worthless for you. Okay? Mm -hmm. To let yourself be formed by this, you're on that solid rock and solid foundation, and you've got to let it in. And it's not easy. It's not easy for any of us. Like I said, look how hard I resisted God. He had to break my back, all right? And I'm, thank God I, I changed then. I don't know what would have happened after that. <laughs> Maybe there's been a paraplegic or something, okay? I don't know. Even think of Joni Erickson Tata. She's a paraplegic, 
wonderful minister to women and everything. She's on the radio all the time. And she even says, if you listen to her talking, she says if she could go back, she wouldn't change anything. 18 years old, she broke her neck. She, can, she draws pictures with her mouth, okay? And she's completely paralyzed from the neck down, but it brought her into such a relationship with Jesus Christ. She says, when I look back, I wouldn't change anything. It was God's will. It was how God did it. And praise the Lord, okay? Praise Blessed God. be the name of the Lord. Imagine that. Getting to that kind of point from something like that. You know, most people, you see them in the hospital, they want to kill themselves once they become a paraplegic. They want to die. And yet she had come to that point of faith and belief. What an amazing thing is that, all right? But it all goes back to good Bible teaching. We need good Bible okay. teaching, all right? They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Wow. That tells us, like, man, God told them not to talk about him in, in uh, Galatia and the Phrygian region, okay? You know, they were forbidden to speak about it in Asia. That sounds weird. Why? I don't know why, okay? Later they did. They got to talk about it later. But that's why we've got to be led by the Spirit. I think it's Romans 8, 5, maybe. It says those who are the sons of God are those who are led by the Spirit of God, okay? So at times, we don't need to speak. We don't need to always be right. We don't need to fix everything. It's God that fixes everything, okay? And that's a hard time for a lot of us guys. It's something I've been learning real hard to not think I have to fix everything, okay? It's made, I think it's a trait almost of putting the men, and we want to fix things. And we've got to stop, and we've got to be like, you know what? Is this the right way? Is this the right time, you know? We've got, we've got to admire it. We've got to be led by the Spirit, once again, I go back. How are we led by the Spirit of God? By staying in close relationship with God. How can we stay in close relationship with God? Without feeding on the Word of God every single day, being in the Bible, without being in prayer every single day, we can't be in that kind of relationship with God that we can be sensitive to the things of God, okay? Then it's going to be like Jonah. What happened to Jonah? He didn't want to preach to Nineveh. Try to go the other way. God crashed the boat. God had a big fish swallow him up for three days. And then God spit him out, vomited him right where he's supposed to go. Okay? God's going to get his way one way or another. Okay? I don't want to be that guy that lives in the fish for three days. All right? Imagine how nasty that is. All right? When I clean fish or something, it's like, ooh, oh, look at this. I wouldn't want to have it in my head, you know, be inside of that. Could you imagine what kind of way it was for that man for three days? So we want to be obedient to God. We want to be led by the Spirit. And I tell you what, if you don't know how, I'll tell you the recipe. Pray, read your Bible. You know, if you don't get it, keep reading it right there. All of a sudden, it all comes through to you. And it'll be like, it'll be just a blessing to you. All right? And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia. And the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Okay? Who is the Spirit of Jesus? It's the Holy Spirit. All right? The Spirit of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And here's one thing for your tidbit information right here, is when people try to tell you how you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit and a second work of grace, take them over to Romans chapter 8, verse 9. And it says, everybody who's saved is baptized in the same Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. There is not one person today who's a Christian who hasn't been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So when somebody asks me, they say, were you baptized in the Holy Spirit? I say, indeed I was. The moment I was saved is when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they'd be like, no, no, I mean, don't you speak in tongues and all this stuff? I'm like, no, listen, I'll take you to Romans 8 9 and I'll show you there is no such thing as a believer who's not baptized in the Spirit of Christ. And what is the Spirit of Christ? It's the Holy Spirit, all right? And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Okay, so here a vision came to him, like in a dream or something, and he's like, some guy's like calling in a foreign land, be like somebody from Indiana calling you, hey, come to Indiana and preach to me the gospel. And he's like, I'm there, I'm going. Okay, that's how quick he went. Look how immediately he followed God, okay? Just make sure it's really God sending you there, okay? Because some people, the thing that I hate to hear is, well, the Lord told me this. Because most of the time when they tell me that, and I watch them for a few months, things fail. It didn't work out for them. And I think, so now you, you, you belittle the name of the Lord. You told me the Lord told you to do this. And obviously, He did not tell you to do that. And you told everybody He did. That's straight up embarrassing, okay? Maybe you can say, I feel led that I should be doing this. But be careful about saying the Lord told me, all right? If, unless you're a prophet or an apostle... I wouldn't say the Lord told you to do anything. 
Unless you're saying, the Lord told me sexual immorality is wrong. Well, you can say that because that lines up with the Bible. So why did you really need to say the Lord told me? You can say, the Bible says right here, okay? But beware, because there's a lot of people out there trying to do a lot of crazy magic tricks. And at the end of the day, you see that they're very rich people as well. Because they get your money also in the end, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a fruit, a bad fruit that you see going on. So I'm going to close here. It says, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. All right? And this is the truth. Every single Christian, Matthew 20, 18, 20, has given us your purpose for life. The purpose you have for life is to share Christ and make disciples and teach them. Amen. You may not be a preacher, okay? You may be a, what would that say? A, a baker? A butcher. A butcher or a candlestick maker. You may be one of those guys. And even if you're one of those guys... You have a little pulpit right around you. You've got other candlestick makers. You've got other bakers. You've got customers. You've got different people who get to know you. And as they get to know you, and that talk happens in the break room, wherever, you can stand up and say, you know what? You're all talking about this. That's not how I think about it. I think about it like this. Let me tell you why I think about it like that. Share the gospel with them. Be a friend to them. Be a discipler. And then when you start to see them catch on and learn these things, don't ignore them. Man, look at that as a treasure right there. What a treasure. That's an eternal treasure. Like I said a few weeks ago, when you die and you go to heaven one day, if they were to put you off in piles of who discipled who and who did God use to save other fellows and things, and you're all by yourself because you never even opened your mouth up to share Christ crucified, it's going to be humiliating. Okay? You don't want that. You want to have a big crowd around you, man. I want a massive crowd around me. I want to be like, yes, praise God that God used me and I got to be a part of this person and this person and that person coming to Christ. Okay? Amen. So we should have that kind of that kind of passion if we're a Christian. And I tell you how we develop passion, what did I say before? Read the Bible, man. Get in there. Dig into it. Let it wash over your mind. Let it through that screen of protection in your life to, to, to reform you and change you. And so I write in here, is this your life goal? Is your life goal to share Christ crucified? It should be. Every single Christian, this should be our life goal. I'm not saying that you have to be in the ministry. I'm saying God's giving you a pulpit somewhere in life, all right? And uh, to, is your life goal to please Christ and proclaim Him, or is He just something you're using to get, okay? I'll tell you, the best way, I think, to see is somebody a born-again believer or not, is do they stay a born-again believer, Okay? 1 John 2.19 tells us that some of them left them, like guys who were hanging out with the apostles. Why? Because they were never believers to begin with. If we want to see the biggest fruit of our salvation, of perseverance, that's what it is. In fact, that's better said than once saved, always saved, is the perseverance of the saints. Because once saved, always saved, can make a guy think, well, you know what, I came to an altar, I said a prayer one day, lived my rest of my life like the devil, never went anywhere near church, and I'm saved. And that's definitely not what that doctrine means, okay? But with, if you look at it the right way, it does mean the right thing, okay? You are saved, you stay saved, okay? But even a better way to say it with, with church doctrine is perseverance of the saints. Those who persevere to the end were saints. Those who persevere to the end were saved right there, okay? And that's where we'll see it when we, when we go through. And we can ask ourselves, if do, we wanna, should, do we run as one with passion to win? Because you know what Paul says? He says, we should be running as the one to win. Now, let me tell you, I don't know how many of you ran before. I know some of you guys have run before. It's painful. It hurts. The way I used to look at it in the military when I was a young ranger, ranger at a time, I would be scared because they would punish me for maybe six or eight hours of push-ups, up, down, crawl through the mud, run around the building, get down in the swamp. If I were to just fall off from an arm's length from the man in front of me, I'd be praying to Jesus, Lord, please, don't let me fall out. I'd have all these pains in my side. I'd be pushing myself tremendously right there so I could make it. And let me tell you, after I made it, each day I had to do that. They ran five days a week just like that. Even if they said, this is going to be a slow run, boom, they took off. And I was just trying to fly to stay with them right there. And I tell you what, that really helps me understand this right here about the passion to win. you got to be that guy that's willing to go above and beyond and take the pain and continue on. Because you know that this is the Lord, this is His way, and it's more important than anything else in life. Okay? Mm -hmm. it, uh, what bothered me so bad when I was in the military was when I worked at ROTC, after I broke my back and stuff, I got to teach there two years, but it was good because I was only gone three months a year instead of nine months a year. And as I was there, 
I remember the students, young college students who were going to be officers were like, what's the minimum standard? I just got to know how many push-ups, how many sit-ups, how fast do I have to run just to pass. And I had never seen this in my career because I've been around guys who were in the front, guys who didn't even know what the minimum standards were. We were interested in what's the maximum because we not only want to get that, we want to surpass that. If we don't get a 300 out of 300 on a physical training test, we're a failure is how we looked at it in our eyes, okay? We were humiliated. Sometimes I get a 292, and I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. This is awful, you know? Well, the regular army sometimes, like, they just want to get the basic 180. 180 you have to pass out of 300 points. And that's how these students were, and it bothered me so bad. And I thought, what? The minimum? Who cares about the minimum? Let's make it to the maximum. Until I realized what I was dealing with with a lot of them, I thought, okay, let's just hope that they can get the minimum. But that's not where we want to be. As Christians, we want to be the person out in the front. And we want to run this race as we're going to win. And we want to keep on running and stay in this fight, like I said, the perseverance, and finish well. We want to finish strong. We want to go all the way through with it. And we want to be there in Christ's kingdom. And we want to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Okay? And he doesn't say that because of something that we did or a hard passion running. Everything is because of God. You know, he gives us the energy to, to have this energy to run, to do all these things. But I'll tell you what, if we're not even willing to pick up a Bible and read and pray or, or gather for fellowship with one another and pray for one another and strengthen one another, how are we going to stay in this race? You know, These are the basic fundamentals of the Christian faith. Okay? is you read the Bible, you pray, and you hang out with other Christians, okay? Usually that means you go to church. Now some Christians, maybe they can't go to church, but at least they can have a Christian friend or something come by and, and have some kind of way of fellowship, all right? So we'll go ahead and we'll close your eyes and we'll pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you today for each and every single person here today, Lord. Lord, I thank you for, 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 the, for the love that they have that you've given them. I thank you for the, your spirit that's within them, Lord Jesus. I thank you for... for for the breath that they breathe, Lord, the breath that they breathe in their nostrils even right now that comes solely and alone from you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I ask that you strengthen them, that you help them, that you equip them, and you help them, Lord, to be able to run this race that you put before them, Lord. Help them to sit back and ponder and think about eternity and think about how short this life is, Lord. In your Bible, over and over and over again, you have so many passages to say that our life is but a vapor that is whisked away. Our life is but a flower that blooms and is gone. That our life is here today and gone tomorrow. And that we are but forgotten, Lord. That we go back from dust we came to dust we shall return. Lord, in this short life that we have, help us to make a difference for you. Help us to be obedient to you. Help us to be strong for you, Lord. Help us to run this race, Lord. And above all, Lord, as we follow you, help us to make disciples. Help us to love those, Lord, who you you bump, have us bump into their path and that they'll become believers as well and that we're able to train them and teach them and help them on this way and be a brother and a sister to them, Lord Jesus. And Lord, for anybody here today who may not know you, Lord Jesus, as their personal Lord and Savior, who doesn't know you as God Almighty, who, who's in the darkness yet, Lord, Lord, I ask that you open up your light to them. You shine it on them, Lord, that you help them to see beyond the shadow of a doubt who you are, that you're real, that you love them, that you died for them, Lord, and that you paid for every single one of their sins on that cross, Lord, that there is nothing that they have to do to earn their salvation, but that you did it all for them, Lord, and that they would believe even today, Lord Jesus. Lord, help anybody that's here today to, to be able to beat their chest and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, Lord, and Lord, may salvation begin today and then. May you draw them by your Holy Spirit, and may they be saved and in your hands forever. You said in John chapter 6 that there is no one that the Father gives you that you will ever lose, Lord. I thank you so much for that, Lord, for every believer that's here, that there's no way we can fall out of grace with you, Lord Jesus. And I thank you so much, Lord, that for everybody who ever will be a believer, that you are going to save them, Lord. I thank you, and I praise you, Lord, and I worship you. Lord, I ask today before we eat our potluck, Lord, that you bless our food, you bless our fellowship with one another, and you'd help us to strengthen each other, Lord. And I thank you for each and every person here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. You came and heard. Now don't go and serve. At least get some food, even if you have to rush out, get a little plate to go right there.
And there's a little announcement right here my friend Lou wants to say. Thank you, Pastor. As you can tell, the pastor is on fire for the Lord. Now, now for you visitors, the potluck is a new experience, but we'd like you, we invite you to come first. And I think the way we're going to do this is going through here. Yep, yep, go through here. So you visitors, please step up and lead the way for the rest of us to enjoy the potluck. Thank you.